Good morning. This is uh, Sunday School here. We're continuing through the book of Acts, Acts chapter number 9. We are on part number 15. That doesn't really mean anything. We've been studying water baptism and the Apostle Paul's water baptism. At that point in time, his name was obviously Saul of Tarsus. So I hope you guys are all doing well this morning. If you have your Bibles, uh, we're going to be flipping around just a little bit here. But I hope that as we've been going through this topic of water baptism, that it's been helpful. I mean, I hope that it, this really has been a, a, a detailed study of water baptism to the extent that you can now feel a little bit more comfortable with the topic and that you can then go back when somebody asks you a question about water baptism and teach somebody through the scriptures. You can say, well, let me show you some verses on water baptism. Not being hostile, of course, but being an educator because in, in all honesty, what we need to do more and more is educate Christianity. We're trying to help them see things the way that God sees them. It's not seeing things the way we see them, you know. That's a lot of people say, well, well one, of my, one of my friends came to Bible study, and he was talking to his parents and his brother, and he says, you know, the only problem is, he says, but when I tell them things, they say, well, you learned that from Jason at Bible study, right? So how do you avoid doing that? Just cool verses, right? Just go to the verse and just read the verse and say, well, well, okay, maybe I, maybe I did, maybe I was shown this particular Bible verse in Bible study, yes, okay? Just like you were shown a lot of verses at church. So let's go and let's talk about the actual verses and let's compare the scripture and see what it says. You know, when, when thinking or discussing water baptism with others, I hope that you've been able to kind of get a better kind of framework of how this is not something that just uh, originated with John the Baptist, Right? I think a lot of people would say, oh, water baptism happened with John the Baptist. That's the first place we saw it, when in fact that's really not correct. Water baptism was seen throughout the entire history of the nation of Israel in the forms of their many uh, cleansings that they had and the, the different purifications that they had. So in particular, we made some, uh, some, some, some comparisons, I would say, with the term baptism and cleansing, right? So you can use these as synonyms, cleansing, purification, or washing. So when you see those words used, baptism, cleansing, purification, washing, you can see that they are all synonyms. We demonstrated there are a multitude of not just baptisms in the scripture, right? We know that. But there are a multitude of water baptisms. So just think about baptism and somebody says, well, define baptism. Well, what is it going to be? Washing, purification, cleansing, sanctification, so on and so forth. Understanding that it's never able to take away sin, it is that answer of the good conscience toward God, and that good conscience comes by the purification which is done by faith. Remember that Hebrews chapter number 6 verse 2 talks about that doctrine of baptisms, right? It's that plural. But in the end, we know and understand that, that real purification, right? Real cleansing, real absolute perfection is done not by water, but is done by what? Done by the blood of Christ applied to you on what basis? What's the basis how you get that? Belief or faith. So faith is what allows us to be made complete. Faith is what allows us to really start to appreciate the work of God. Baptism, baptism is a work of man. It's a work of the flesh. It's something you would do. It's a, it's a work. It's outward. It's not faith, right? It's doing, right? Follow me? Makes perfect sense here. Purification is always done by faith, and we made that very clear uh, throughout all the scriptures. From the very beginning to the very end, purification is done by faith, and the purification that I'm talking about is getting your heart cleansed before God in the way that God justifies you. God declares you righteous. God says, yes, you are now, your sins have been paid for, and they weren't paid for by you. They were paid for by Christ and his death on the cross. Remember that he took upon himself the sins of the world, did he not? And the reason why we know that those sins were paid for and that you have forgiveness of sins is because Christ was resurrected. And so God took those sins and he, he took them upon himself in the form of Jesus Christ and paid for them on your behalf. But how we get that applied to us is on the basis of faith. And I want to go to a passage in Acts chapter 15, please. This passage will become more and more important in the next few weeks as we get to the issue of Cornelius. So as I was just telling Scott, the issue of Cornelius there in Acts chapter number 10 will probably be there in, I'd say, about two weeks, is going to be one that uh, is a great turning point in the book. 
So when you're reading the book of Acts, Acts 10, I mean, Acts 9 is huge. I mean, really, Acts 7 is huge. Acts 9 is huge. Acts 10 is huge. I mean, they're all huge, but there's some big pivotal changes that we really see, things that provide more information. So what I really want to talk about today is the appreciation of the work of God by the figures and patterns. I want to look at the need for faith, what results when you fail to appreciate the patterns and figures, and why we can't just say, God, why did you have to use, you know, figures and types and patterns and shadows? Man says this, God, why couldn't you have made it simpler for me to understand? God, why couldn't you have made it more clear? To which I say, hold on, you're thinking about it the wrong way. The reason is because your mind is trying to use man's logic, man's wisdom to understand the scripture, when in fact you need mind renewal, which is done daily, which is done hourly, which is done every minute of your day, to use the mind of Christ to understand spiritually what occurs around you. Everything that happens, I don't care what it is, I apply spiritual uh, uh, mindset to it. And in Acts chapter number 15 and verse number 7, a spiritual mindset here to the law is demonstrated. And if you'll read here, Acts chapter 15 is, a, is the Jerusalem Council. Many of us are fairly familiar with this passage here. Uh, Paul goes by revelation to preach that gospel which he was preaching to the Gentiles too. Uh, uh, several men there, of course, the three, James, Peter, James, and John are the most uh, prominent. In verse number 7, there had been this big disputation between them about uh, whether or not men were being justified or saved by works or needing to keep the law or getting circumcised or whatever it might be. So what ends up happening after much disputing in verse 7, it says, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God made a choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So we're going to look at that in Acts chapter number 10, and we're going to also compare that back over with some passages in Luke 24. This is going to be in two weeks, so just mark it later. Verse 8, And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. And put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. And so that purification process is only done by faith. There's no other way it can be done. What is accomplished on our behalf in this faith, many say this, it's easy believism. It's too simple. It, it, it's just you just got to believe, and that's when you fail to appreciate what really took place, right? What is accomplished on our behalf through faith, that would be God's work when we believe, is, I would say, rarely taught clear. And then what ends up happening is you fail to appreciate the power of the cross. You fail to really appreciate, well, what transpired between the cross and then the resurrection? And then what transpired between the resurrection and Christ's final ascension? Lots. I mean... Everything. Your justification depends upon it. But yet it's not really taught. And so as a result, you, you fail to appreciate the, 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 the work behind your faith. So yes, there's a lot of things that took place. People say, oh, it's just easy believism. Yes, for you to be saved, it is as easy as you just believing. But what, it, what God did for you was, as we would look at it, very difficult. Into Christ in his flesh, when he took on the form of a man and was made, a little lower than the angels, and tasted death for every man, that was difficult for him. He says many times, throughout, especially in the garden there, he says, my, my spirit is willing, but my flesh is weak. And so our flesh is always going to be weak, just like Christ was weak. But our spirit is willing, our spirit is ready, but we need to renew that mind and have an understanding of what that means. Hebrews, I think, has been a book that we've talked an awful lot about, has it not? And Hebrews is that book, as we say, is the book to teach the Hebrews how they should be Hebrews. And what these, these, uh, these figures, the framework that God has laid out by these figures and patterns and shadows and types, what they really meant. And so he, he really shouldn't have had to tell you this. He should have connected the dots. But, of course, he's going to lay it out quite clearly. While we've been studying out water baptism... Throughout the Hebrews' life, they were subject to these different water baptisms. We looked back at Numbers, 
Uh, we looked at some in Leviticus there with the priestly washings, lots of these different ones. And we even saw up until John the Baptist and what they were doing there. But throughout their bondage to the law, their imperfect washings and cleansings, they were not really appreciating, you know, what was to come. And there's a reason why. I would say that the appreciation of what transpired after Christ's death and, and through Christ's death will enable you to not doubt whether or not you're saved. It'll help you in never doubting God and his forgiveness. And it will help you in never doubting whether or not your eternal life is guaranteed and heaven is your home. If you look at the book of Hebrews, please, chapter number 1, Hebrews chapter 1, verse number 3, we read the following. This is to help you appreciate. This is how to, to help the Hebrews appreciate what Christ did, what God did. And he says, who being the brightness of his glory. Jesus Christ is often referred to as being light. John 3. And he says, and the express image of his person. When you look at the law, you have express and you have an implied, right? Jesus Christ isn't the implied image. He's the express image of God. In John chapter number 1, he discusses that. No man has seen God at any time, but Jesus Christ declares him. And if you look here, that the express image of his person, he says, in upholding all things by the word of his power. When he had by himself purged our sins. He did that by himself. He didn't need you to come in and say, hey, let me help out a little bit. Can I tell you that the reason why we have these figures and patterns and shadows is to show you what the issue is up in the heavens? And I'd like to ask you, where are you going to go to the Holy of Holies, to the mercy seat, and, and shed your blood? Do you know how to get there? No, you don't. And you need somebody to do that for you. And that's why Jesus Christ, being eternal, understands exactly what needs to take place, exactly where he should go and goes and does it. I love that word that he says he upholds all things. He says upholding all things by the word of his power. The word of God needs to be magnified above everything else in your life. 100% is what you rely upon every day. Because, quite frankly, if faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, you better understand the Word of God. You know that in fact you can't help is part of the gospel. You realize that? Your inability to help is part of the gospel. That's something you need to believe before you can be saved. It is. You realize that you have to understand and submit yourselves to the righteousness of God, which is by faith. I'd like for you guys also to listen to the message we preached on Romans 10 last, uh, last Wednesday here. Some of this stuff really segues nicely. Not really uh, on purpose, I guess, but it is the continuity of Scripture and that everything runs together so great. The appreciation that is lacking for what transpires upon faith is, again, what is it due to? It's due to everything else, an incomplete reading of the word in isolation. Remember, we talked about this. This is part of our recap. We talked about isolation theology, creating a theology based upon bits and pieces of verses and in the law, that never works. In the law, you know what the law requires? I like to use this as a shadow and as a picture, again, because all these things that we have in this world are, are figures and shadows, which we'll look at in a second in Romans 1. But the term, what we call is the totality of the circumstances. So when they're trying to make a determination, are they going to say, well, I got a I got little bit of thing here, and they're going to try to present it? No, what are they going to use? They're going to use the totality of of the circumstances in which every circumstance, not just the ones that are beneficial and the ones that aren't, not just the verses that are to you, but all of the Bible. He says this. I, I say this. I'm writing, reading my own reading. He says, I say, the facts, the context, 
they must be considered to form a whole picture. It's not just the Hebrews that fail to look at the scripture and appreciate the figures and the types, the shadows, right? It's not just them. We can't just say, oh, stupid Hebrews. We're right in that same category. So we need, to be, need not be arrogant in thinking that, oh, wow, these this dumb Israelites, they just missed it. And, you know, well, as a whole, when we minister to the body of Christ, we're trying to get everyone to see what is the fellowship of that mystery and to understand, yes, of course, dispensational Bible truth. I remember those passages in 2 Corinthians chapter number 3. I just want to touch on those briefly. Look at 2 Corinthians 3 for me. In verse number 12, he says, Paul says this, Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. He goes, It's not as Moses would put a veil over his face. The children of Israel cannot steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. He says, But their minds, their minds were blinded. He says, For until this day remaineth the same veil, untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. He goes, But there's hope. Verse 15, but even unto this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, what? When it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. When you understand that, you start to see your ministry in verse chapter 4, verse 1, that that ministry is to show people about this. And, and this includes water baptism. This includes being able to explain to individuals what water baptism is about. Verse 4, he says, therefore, seeing we have this ministry, we're, we're using plainness of speech. We're trying to be very clear. We're trying to make things very simple and clear. But we use God's word. We don't just try to make uh, uh, you know, great analogies all the time. Sure, do we use analogies? Of course we do. They help us understand things. But we are able to point people to the right scriptures and use scripture and scripture to explain. In 2 Corinthians 4, verse 1, he says, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, and that ministry is all about, uh, some about the New Testament, which I love to talk about. We don't have time today. But he goes on to say, this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience. So when you fail to appreciate those figures, these, 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 these little shadows, the, the types, everything, unfortunately, what happens? You're getting an incomplete picture, and you're going, Hey, God, why can't you be more clear? Man, you're so confusing. Your Bible's so hard to get. Why didn't you make it simpler? I mean, is that really, can we say that? I don't, I don't think we can. Because when we say that, we're trying to use man's wisdom. When somebody says, oh, but the ESV is so much easier to read. Is it? Or did a man just make it easier to read for you by removing and by changing? That totality of the circumstances is important. In 2 Corinthians 4, you see that obviously Satan, he blinds. He looks at verse, chapter 4, verse 4. He says, in whom the God of this world hath blinded. And even after salvation, many believe lies. Satan's main prerogative is to do what? Is to keep everyone out of the body of Christ. And that is why he can do whatever he can do. Whatever he can possibly do, anything he will do to mess with the cross, to mess with the resurrection, to mess with salvation, to introduce water baptism, to create and debate, and really, ultimately, deceive. So the failed appreciation because of the inability to see God's working through types and figures, and it, it, does it frustrate a lot of people? Of course. Do a lot of people go, man, I, just, I, I, don't, I don't really know anything about the Bible. I don't really get it. But what are these types? Let's look at the book of Hebrews, please, and we'll look at their, their patterns. Hebrews chapter number 9. What does a pattern really do? When you think about a pattern, it shows you what comes next, doesn't it? You kind of anticipate. Some patterns are really hard, right? They have things called like logic games. I don't know if you've ever seen a logic game before. A logic game or, or like a Mensa. Have you ever seen Mensa before? Anybody familiar with Mensa? Mensa is basically an organization for individuals who have super high IQs. So what they do is they say, well, <laughs> <laughs> so, so what Mensa will have is they'll have a little block, right? And so the, how, how they work the Mensa test is that they'll have a little block, right? And you have to look at it. 
and you get a t it's a time limit test, and so you have to look at it, and you basically go, here's block one, here's block two, here's block three, what should come in block four? And so you have to basically find the pattern and pick it out and, and do it really quickly. So uh, I've taken some of the tests. Some of them are, I mean, some of them are just ridiculous. I mean, they're downright insane. You look at them, you're like, I have no idea what they're doing. What is, what is this thing? So you know, it'd be like a little circle, a little square, another little circle, and a square. And so they alternate positions, and then you have to figure out the pattern. But of course, some people see the pattern much easier than others. Their minds just think that way. And so for us, when you see that pattern, you go, uh, let's somebody, so say somebody showed you the pattern in, uh, in, in one of these Mensa tests. You could be really good at it. If somebody gave you a book of all the Mensa patterns and they worked you through, let's say you had 100 questions, you would be very good at those patterns after somebody showed you how to do them, right? And you could show people and say, hey, look, I can take this Mensa test, watch this, do, 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 and show them all the patterns that they worked out. That's because somebody showed you the pattern and how it was to work. But if somebody gave you the, the pattern and they didn't show you how the pattern works, what are you going to do? Well, I don't know. So the pattern of salvation, as we see, is talked about through the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy, is he not? Does he say he's a pattern to those who should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting? Right? Remember that passage? So just the same thing. Again, this is Paul's telling you how he got saved. He believed on him to life everlasting. Nothing to do with his water baptism. But in Hebrews chapter number 9, verse number 23, after he's gone through this big dissertation in chapter 9 about the worldly sanctuary, right? about what takes place in the temple, what these priests are doing. He talks about the divers' washings in Hebrews 9, verse number 10. He talks about the meats and drinks, and he talks about the carnal ordinances. He talks about the blood of bulls and goats. And then he goes on in here, and he says this in verse 23. It was therefore, what, necessary that the pattern of things in the heavens should be purified with these. Now, I want to make sure this is really clear here. The pattern of the things in heaven should be purified with these. So he's showing you that there is a, that what's taking place here on earth, there is the same thing going on in heaven, and they're not being purified with these, that is to say, with what's actually taking place. But look what he goes on to say. But the heavenly thing, see the pattern is what's down here on earth. He goes, it's made after the likeness of what? What's up in heaven. So the pattern, he says, is the heavenly things themselves with what? With better sacrifices than these. And of course, we know what that sacrifice would be. That sacrifice would be Christ. Because you just read through all here that, that he is that sacrifice. That he is the, the one and only. He says, for Christ has not entered into the holy place made with what? Made with hands. So wait, there's a holy place not made with hands? Yeah, God spoke it into existence. Wow. So what this enables you to really do is it starts to put a realization on heaven. It starts to allow you to see people say, where's all these verses? How do, you, how do you guys know so much about heaven? Well, we read verses. And then we started to put pieces together. And we're starting to see more and more about this. Well, why couldn't God make it really simple? Heaven's like this. Here's Heaven Street. Here's Jesus Christ Avenue. Your house is on the corner of Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ. You live in the townhomes over there. You don't get the mansion. People, that's what people really want. They want it to be super clear. But you've got to remember, by saying that, you tell God, man, you're not really good at what you do. You follow me? Why that's really kind of belittling to God? Well, it's why it's belittling to God to say, make it easier. He did make it easy. But it couldn't be any easier. And that's the beauty of it. But you may say, no, I disagree. It's so hard. It's so confusing. It's so complex. Yes, it requires study. And study is, is does take time to get the understanding. But you keep going through your life, and you get it through the Spirit, and you have individuals who will sit here and teach and, and rightly divide the word of truth so that you are able to not be confused, meaning that you don't, you don't necessarily need us all the time, right? So what ends up happening is this. You know, I was talking to somebody the other day, and, and they said, well, you know, you're kind of a product of the, the ministry of, of Suncoast. You're a product of Frank, and you're a product of Ross. And so you're just a product of somebody else's ministry now. So... Well, well, yeah, I mean, we are we are products. I mean, what, what's the problem? I mean, we're fellow laborers together. There's no problem in that. Somebody's showing you the gospel. You, I, I told that person, I said, well, you're a product of so-and-so. They shared you the gospel, and then you're a product of this pastor, and you sat underneath their leadership for so long, and you're a product of, and then I think they saw it. Like, oh, okay. 
See, because I think the problem is I, I would say that I speak a little more boldly than most people do, right? I think that I come across um, uh, like I believe what I talk about. I think that's what it really comes down to. I'm not a, uh, what does my dad used to call it? Wil what's the term? Wilbur milk toast? I don't even know what that is. Does anybody know what that is? Wil Wilbur milk toast? I, I don't know. I don't know what that is. I'm sure it's probably something from the 50s, you know. Okay, so it's just really hesitant and just shallow foundation, right? So, you know, I'm not a Wilbur Milk Toast. I, I don't really know what that means, but I've used it a couple of times. But, but either way, when that individual told me I was just a product, I said, well, you know, it's pretty interesting that, that Paul, you know, everybody would be a product of what Paul's gospel is. You, you follow me? And then everybody would be a product of all the people that came before him, as Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 2 and 3. You know, so at the end of the day, everybody's a product of something, but what should you mostly be a product of? The Word of God. I mean, that's where, the, that's where the, the rooting is. That's where the foundation is going to lie. But if you look again here, please, at Hebrews 10, uh, 9, verse 24, he says, For Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the, what? Figures of the, what's the word? True. So what are the ones that are here on earth? Those aren't the true. Oh, those are just figures. So what are we doing here? It's, it's really just a charade. It's to teach you. That's what ultimately all that stuff is there to do. It's there for a, for a teaching purpose. What's the law's purpose? What, is, what does Christ tell you the law's purpose? What does Paul tell you the law's purpose is? The law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Okay, so it's just a teacher. And that's what all of these things should do. The appreciation of the work of God by figures and patterns is you get taught. And you go, yeah, I, I appreciate those things. Thanks, thanks, God, for letting me see things how you see them. And thanks for letting me see kind of a glimpse of the mind of God to allow you, me to see what you're doing up there in the third heaven. You know, people would say, well, well hold on. Well, that's, that's, that's confusing again still. Why not make it three points in a poem, you know? Well, it's because God doesn't think like you. If we haven't got that through yet, you know, that's why in, in Acts 15, if you go back there, that's why James is, he, James is like, look, you know what? He's like, oh, whatever. Look at Acts 15 with me for just a second. I love this one. Look at uh, verse 17 of Acts 15. So James goes through this whole thing, and, he, and, and you know, he, I'd like to go through all of it, but again, I want to save some of this for Acts 10. But go to verse 17. James speaks after Peter. And so if, if James, this is the same James, of course, that wrote James chapter number 2. You can go through that. If, if this James here were, were believing that you, know, you needed works, he would have explained it here because there would have been no better time to explain it. You follow me what I'm saying? If there was works needed for eternal life, there are works needed for justification. If one needed to keep the law, whatever it would be, he would have said, Peter, no, you're incorrect. I'm sorry. You're wrong. No, but he agrees with Peter. He actually says, you know, uh, Simeonath declared, and he goes down through verse number 17. He says, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord, and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. Now, verse 18 is, I think, where, where James just kind of, he says, you know what, I don't necessarily understand exactly what's going on right now, but I do know someone who does, and that's why he writes, known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. He knows what he's doing. He makes the Bible clear. If, the, if, there's, if, there's, if there's clarity that is lacking, it's probably because of some religious upbringing that you had, and that's the, the reality of it. That's the reality of it. So it's hard for you, even if you have no, people say, well, I've never been involved in religion. Well, yeah, you have. You've been involved in the religion of no religion. That's really what it is. I mean, the atheists are now the, the new free thinkers. It's, it's a whole new religion in relation to that. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16, he says, you know, we have the mind of Christ. That mind of Christ, because Jesus is that express image of God, he's the one in which, what? In him dwelleth what? all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. He's the Savior of the world, and we can possess His understanding through the Word, because ultimately, who is the Word? Jesus Christ is that Word. These shadows, the pictures, the types, which many get confused and distraught about, are in the words of God done to teach you, to help you see. Help you see those patterns. Again, verse 9, go to chapter 9 again of, of Hebrews 9, verse 23. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of the things in the heavens, so the things that are on the earth are patterned after those things that are in heaven. But those things that are in heaven should be purified with these. He says, but the heavenly things themselves, the actual ones with better sacrifices than these. 
for Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. You know what that is? That's advocacy. That's when somebody is on your behalf and does something for you. They're your, they're your advocate. Do you want Jesus Christ as your advocate? I do. Does anybody know? I'm, I mean, I'm really serious about this. Does anybody know where these holy places are, you know, not made with hands? I mean, no. They're in heaven. I mean, but you don't know where they are. You can't go. Does anybody know how to get to heaven? I mean, we do, of course. That's kind of the, the process of, of conclusion there. And that it's, it's done through Christ. Because when you want to get into heaven, you have to do it in the way that he prescribes, and he does it for you. He says, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Who do you want to appear for you? I'd rather have God appear for me. He's always going to make things right. He's always going to do it correctly. I'm not going to mess it up. I'm not going to accidentally say something wrong. This pattern idea is seen again in the book of Romans chapter 1. Paul talks about it here. He says this. Romans chapter 1, verse number 19. People say, I, I don't know anything about God. How can you even believe there's a God? This is so ludicrous. Remember I, this, this, the statement I said last week? <laughs> I said, probably walking all over Frank, sorry. I said, you know, the, the faith, the, the, it takes more faith to believe there is no God than there, than there right? Than, there, than, than, there, than to believe there is a God. And that's because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal Godhead, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. The heavenly things cannot be purified with earthly things. Just think about that for a second. What are you? Carnal. You can't bring anything into heaven that would help your case. You couldn't bring anything to heaven to help purify, and that's why Jesus Christ was sent down from heaven to do exactly that. When Christ resurrected, did he go walk into the temple and be like, hey guys, I got a, I got a cup of my blood. Uh, let's go get this done. Think about it. He didn't do that. He's like, oh, that? That's the devil's house right there. He went to those heavenly pace, places, spoken into existence by God, not man, a place that you and I and no one has ever seen. Again, that, that figures of the true there in Hebrews, it's just so great to know that, that God is using these visible uh, figures, these patterns, the, the, the temple, well, the sacrifices, all to teach us what was to come. You know, Jesus Christ, that advocate in, that, in the court system that we have nowadays, you can, have, uh, you can file a notice to appear, you know? And when you want to file a notice to appear, you can have your counsel appear on your behalf. Notice of appearance of counsel. If you'd like your notice of appearance to counsel to be filed, how do you get that done? by faith. And the second you believe that Christ died for your sins, he says, I'm your advocate now. I live evermore to make intercession on the behalf of you. Really? Yes. Done. Wow. That's pretty powerful stuff. Best attorney I can think of. I believe that most of what we see around us are figures of the heavenly realm of God. And that if we can renew our mind and start to say, hey, you know what? We can appreciate God's creation, design, and plan, but there's a problem of sin that is always going to be there, and we're looking forward to that being removed. Appreciating what Christ did for you, it does uh, it require a change of mind. And the change for the Hebrews, I mean, that would be, that'd be pretty dr drastic for them because of how they were involved in their religion. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 13 just for a second. The Hebrews need to take into consideration that totality of the circumstances. Hey, guys, look at everything. Compare it all. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse number 10, he says this, We have an altar whereof they have no right to eat, which serve the tabernacle. He said, I want to make this distinction here that we have something now that these guys don't have. He says, For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. We talked a little bit about that, right? removing that sin from outside of the camp. 
He says in verse 12, Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. He was, you know, where was, where was it taking take place? It took place in Golgotha. And then, of course, he went down to, to uh, uh, hell or Sheol in paradise. Reading in verse number 13, he says, Let us go therefore unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. This makes a lot of sense for that nation of Israel. This is going to segue nicely in just a second. Verse 14, For here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. So they're looking steadfastly for that kingdom to appear. One of the passages that uh, Frank had mentioned is, you know, Jesus Christ expecting that his enemies be made his footstool. I mean, he's sitting there, he's in heaven right now, but who's still running this world? The prince of the power of the air. Figure means it stands for something. If you don't appreciate the figure, you won't get it. Let the scripture teach you. Go back to 1 Peter. This is that passage that we were going over. 1 Peter. Chapter 3. Verse number, we'll go look at verse number 18 again. He says, For Christ hath also once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, but which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved. By water. Now he says the like figure. So the figure of what took place. Do you not realize too that the death of Christ is, is, is also kind of the, the culmination of all figures? I mean it's the figure of all figures. It still itself is a figure. right? It shows you the need for death. shows you what your sin really brought about. Death. And it shows you the need for the power of God to come in and raise him up. The figure that you're looking at here in chapter 20, right, talking about which were sometimes disobedient once a long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while in the ark was preparing, that's a figure too. It's the figure is who? The figure of the ark is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is a way to escape wrath, is a way to escape judgment, is a, is a way to escape the penalty for sin. And Noah, just like all these other prophets, just like myself and many others, we preach what? Do we not preach righteousness? We do. We absolutely do. If you look at 2 Peter, just go over just another page. 2 Peter chapter number 2, verse number 5. Read this for me. 2 Peter 2, verse 5. And, and he says, And spared not... Actually, go down to verse... Uh, Four. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness, to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example. What's an example? It's a figure. It's something to teach you. Unto those that after should live ungodly and deliver just lot vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. You know who is really comparable to, to Noah would be John the Baptist. John the Baptist and Noah are very similar. John the Baptist was a preacher of righteousness. What they thought he was doing was very strange. Noah was a preacher of righteousness. What they thought he was doing was very strange. But ultimately, there's salvation available. There's salvation from wrath to be had. But people don't want to take advantage of it. And the reason why is seen in Luke chapter number 18. Luke 17. I do that a lot. I read, I read the little numbers at the top of the Bible and it goes 17, 18 and I pick them. So if you ever wonder why I do that. 
verse 26 is a demonstration of what takes place before the coming of Christ. He says this, And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage, until the day of Noah entered into the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. He says, Likewise also it was in the days of Lot. They did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built it. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Verse 30, what were those things for? To teach you about the second coming? He says, even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Anyone who wished to be saved from the judgment of, this, of God can and will be saved. And it's always going to be by faith. The ark is one of, as we've looked at, as a, is that figure of, I would call it total security. It's really God-built. And as a result, it's sealed. No one's getting in, no one's getting out. You can compare that to John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father, what? But by me. That ark, even during that storm, during that problem, we can look at that as, as some of it being the tribulation. I, would, I don't really have a whole lot of time to talk about that today either, but some of these things are dispensational truth. You're going to have to separate, but we'll go through it. Uh, that final resting place of that ark was where? It was on the top of Mount Ararat. And what is that a signification of? Well, if Christ is up there, who else is up there? <laughs> You're up there with him. Wow. If you think about it just for a second, Jesus Christ is seated at the what? Right hand of God. There's a couple of verses, Hebrews 10, 12, 1 Peter 3, 22, Ephesians 1, 20, Colossians 3, 1, Romans 8, 34. But there's a problem that we haven't seen, and, and, and it's a problem that I think frustrates a lot. And it's a problem that Peter talks about. Where are you? Where are you, Jesus? Why have you not come back yet? It's been a long time. It's been an awful long time. And of course, he understands something about the long-suffering of God. But what really happens is, during this long-suffering, the salvation of more and more men takes place. As we said, the earth is his footstool. He is expecting, as I stated, for all of his enemies and foes to be made his footstool, and that would be the cities and the kingdoms becoming his. You know, Matthew 5.35 says the earth is his footstool, and Jerusalem is that city of the great king. He's still waiting to sit on that throne on the earth. If you go back to 1 Peter just for a second, we'll close with this. When he writes that, and he says, The figure whereunto even baptism doth not also save us. I mean, the baptism is another figure. We've understood that. I think we've clarified that. And we've ultimately showed that baptism stands for purification, which can be understood even more by the resurrection, the death of Christ. And without that baptism, that death baptism, which I would like to talk about, and give you some verses, Luke 12, 49 through 52, Mark 10, 38 through 39, Matthew 20, 20 through 22, and then Romans 6. Without that baptism, it's just another washing, like all the other washings. It's Christ's death. It's his resurrection, which fulfills all the figures. It gives us the real hope, not a temporary ceremonial cleansing, as demonstrated figuratively in the Old Testament. The figure stands for what saves. Christ and faith. Next week I want to look and show you when did baptism change? When did when did we when do we when do we stop practicing water baptism? When did that when should have that taken place? When did it take place? How did that come about? Well there's only one person that we can really go to ask this question, and that's gonna be Paul. He's gonna tell us pretty pretty uh, cl uh, clear how that works, but I want to make sure it's understood when we get through uh, uh, Acts 10, that that's a big turning point in terms of the issue of water baptism. It's a turning point for what Peter understood it to maybe be, and then what it ultimately was demonstrated to be. And I hope this has been helpful, and we'll pick up again uh, uh, next week with when did baptism change? And I think this will be the last week on, next week will be the last week on baptism, and we'll finish out uh, Acts 9. There's some things that take place, and then we'll pick right up in Acts 10, which is uh, uh, going to take us a while. So let's close in prayer.